thank you, Marie, and all the others in our music ministry making our worship and spirit and truth wonderful today. It's good to see you here. Glad that you're here, and um, hope that you have a wonderful day, whatever Mother's Day brings to you. I know it brings to us all the uh, myriad of emotions, joyful. Some are here with our moms. Some remember our moms have gone to heaven. Um, some may be struggling with uh, what this day means and what it brings. And I understand that. And uh, hopefully being surrounded by loving others will help you this day as well. And uh, the only word of pastoral word of caution I'll give to you today is mostly to the men. If you just remembered it is Mother's Day, <clears throat> I encourage you to get to the card store and the telephone very quickly and make sure you say hello and bring your mom love and she is blessed to still be with you. You know, there was a recent survey done and the question was, who had the most positive influence on your religious faith? Most of the 10,000 people surveyed, who do you think they said? Mother, they did. It was also, um, Roy Angel once said that um, he did a, a, a survey of about 600 university students and they were asked to write down on one piece of paper the one English word in our language that they considered to be most beautiful. Out of 600 people anonymously writing something down on a piece of paper, 422 wrote the word mother. Another 112 wrote home, the most beautiful word in the English language. I know I've, uh, when I've had prayer conferences and classes on prayer, uh, sometimes I've asked the question, what or who was the most influential person concerning your prayer life today? Most of the answers are mother. A mother's love is special. A mother's nurture stays with us for a lifetime. A mother's influence is seen time and time again in our lives. Even after our mothers like mine has gone to heaven or we have flown the nest sometimes may even thinking we're getting away from our mother. Mother's influence stays there. I believe that the love of a mother has those special qualities and characteristics we've come to cherish. Those characteristics and those qualities come from God. God gives those to moms. God gives those to our moms. And a mother has these special abilities to nurture, protect, and care because she's been made in God's image. And because God gives that part of himself to her, that love, that nurture, to help raise us, her children, but also to witness to the world about God's love. It's a dual thing. Well, if we think about God giving these special abilities to our mothers to share with us about the Lord God, Peter thought about that as well. And if you turn in your Bibles or on your cell phones to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, or chapter 2, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, 1 Peter is near the end of the, your New Testament kind of after Hebrews, the easy way to find it is it's right before 2 Peter. Yeah. Okay. But 1 Peter, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Peter says this, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it 
you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And then down in verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord today. Well, mothers, one way they remind us of God's nurture, of God's love, is that Peter says, just like newborn babies were to crave the spiritual milk that Jesus gives us so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Crave the spiritual milk. You know, there's nothing more intimate, so sweet, so loving, so nurturing, so warm, so close as a mother feeding her baby. There is just a tenderness and a bond there that on this earth cannot be matched. And she does this because she wants to see her child become strong, to become nourished, to be comfortable and satisfied. She wants to see her child's needs met. And even after that nursing's over, that nurturing continues, that baby gets the clothing they need, the proper shelter, they're taught how to get along in the world with other people. Eventually they learn to read and write and, and even play with others nicely in a good way. Moms give us the essentials that we need to not only survive in this world, but to be content and successful in the one that we, in the one that we live in. And for the most part, all of this is done with tender, loving care that only a mom can give. But Peter reminds us, just as a mother nourishes their young, the Lord God nourishes us through the gospel of Jesus Christ, doesn't he? That's where it comes from. Peter says we need to crave this pure spiritual milk offered by God so that we too can mature, so that we too can grow up in our salvation of the Lord. And oh, how God nourishes us. Oh, how God sustains us as the loving Father. When we, uh, his children, are hungry, when we're growling deep within our souls, God sends us the bread of life, Jesus, to fill us and satisfy our cravings, doesn't he? When we're grieving, when we're crying, maybe because we've been bruised and scraped and rejected by the world, maybe because we, after the loss of a loved one, feel neglected, God sends to us the great comforter, the Holy Spirit, to soothe us and to heal us. When we are lost and, and sometimes afraid of the dark that often surrounds our lives, those dark moments, God sends to us the light of the world that, that darkness cannot hide to show us the way. And even those times when we find ourselves dirty, when we find ourselves weighted down with guilt and shame, or that we know we've missed the mark of our loving Father and we sin. Even when we're discouraged about how can our future have any brightness, God sent and fed us his own son when he came and died for us because of God's love that's within his nature. And like the purity and sweetness of the milk our mothers have fed us with, God feeds us the pure milk of the gospel, that we may be saved and that we may grow. And for those of us here that have put his gospel to our lips, for those of us here who have poured that grace and allowed it to be poured into our lives, we know what Peter means when he says in verse 3, you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. 
I understand that in the early, early church, the ancient church, that many of the early Christians, when a new convert was baptized, there would be a ceremony, and uh, they were given a cup of water, a cup of milk, laced with honey, and a cup of wine. The water symbolized the baptism they had just had into Jesus Christ. The milk and honey symbolized the nourishing power of the gospel they would have for the rest of their lives. And the cup of wine reminded them of the Lord's Supper that they forever could be reminded of the good news and what Jesus had done for them. You see, through faith, God receives us as his new children. Through faith, God is like a mother in a special sense, nourishing our soul and our lives with the ancient baby formula of salvation and goodness and the Holy Spirit that we may grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. The other characteristic I, I think of that mothers remind us of God is they remind us of God's undying, unconditional love, don't they? The main ingredient of motherhood is not just filling the physical needs. The main ingredient of motherhood is a mother's love, an undying love that will never, ever quit. An undying love that never gives up on their children. It's a love that loves us even when times we deserve rejection and condemnation. My mom had to do that with me a lot growing up. because I gave her plenty of reason to not deserve her love. Let me tell you a story. It's about a man, we'll call him Claude, and he experienced that kind of love all his life. He was a friendly man, the jolly sort of guy. He usually showed up at all the family gatherings, gatherings, enjoyed the special times with his brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, cousins and parents. You know the guy or the gal I'm talking about. Loved to be there, great personality. But Claude also for years and years had a problem, had a disease that, that he just couldn't overcome. And it got worse and worse as the years went on. It caused him to go through five failed marriages. It, his brothers and sisters in the last year began to consider him the black sheep of the family because of his problem. His problem was alcoholism, a terrible disease. It became so severe that in, at the last of his life, he found himself um, with no home, with no money, begging others for money, and still just not had learned to use that money for anything but the next drink. He fought a lifelong war with alcohol and lost almost all his battles. And as I said, as Claude's brothers and sisters considered him the family reject, they, they stayed away from him as much as possible as his drinking worsened. But there happened to be one member of the family who always welcomed Claude when he came around, who always opened their arms and heart to him. And of course, that was Claude's mother. Claude's brothers and sisters couldn't understand their mother's attitude. They talked among themselves about how she loved Claude more than any of them. After all, she t tolerated so much war from him than any of them. At one point, Claude had to be committed to the state mental hospital. Someone had to sign the papers. None of the brothers and sisters wanted to do it. They didn't want to take on the responsibility. There was only one person that was willing to do it. That was Claude's mother. She didn't want to do it, but she signed the papers. She cried before she signed them and she wept afterwards, but she stuck by her son. The rest of the family couldn't understand all those tears for someone as worthless and irresponsible as Claude. 
And they said, Claude's only getting what he deserves. Why is mom carrying on so? But they saw Claude as brother and sister. Mom saw Claude as a son. It reminded me of the great parable, doesn't it? The prodigal son, the lost son, the son that rejected the family, rejected the dad, wasted all of the inheritance, hurt the family business, went away, wasted all of it and his life. Then he has nothing and he comes walking back home in shame. But just like the loving father, there was his father waiting for him. Not with a lecture, not with discipline, but with open arms that no one else could understand. He forgave him, he put on the family robe, he gave him the big ring, slaughtered the best calf and cow, and had a great party. And just like Claude's brothers and sisters, the younger brother's older brother came in and said, what are you doing? He's only getting what he deserves. He deserves this. And the father says, I don't think you're quite getting my perspective on this, the point. He said, your brother was lost, but now he's found. We thought your brother was dead, but now he's alive. Jesus says our Heavenly Father loves us like that. No matter what we think we deserve, no matter what anybody else thinks you deserve, the eternal love of the Father says, you're not going to get what you deserve. You're going to get grace. You're going to get salvation. You're going to get eternal life. You're going to get forgiveness. And he passes on that great love to our mothers. That's where they get it. Mothers know about loving a son or daughter no matter what the conditions, no matter what the situation. And verse 10 that we read in that passage reminds us, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Lord God did not give up on us. Isn't that wonderful news today? We sinned against him. We destroyed our lives little by little. But God loved us. Many just can't understand the tenacity of that love. But that's our great God. And he passes that ability to our family. We have the ability to do the same with each other. So on this Mother's Day, let's let our moms remind us of the great love of God that God nourishes us and takes care of our every need, that God who loves us and keeps on loving us in spite of our rebellion, our sin, our disobedience. Let us know that no matter how far we stray from the fold, we can always run back into the arms of God and find comfort and love and forgiveness. Isn't that why we're here today to worship him? because he loves us so. Thomas Wolfe, a um, noted author, told of his good friend, George Weber. George Weber was a huge man, six foot nine. George Weber wanted to be an author. He moved to New York from North Carolina in search of a career, and he found the going very hard and how difficult it is to write and get it published. And in the mail for his books, he'd receive rejection slip after rejection slip. And it really got him down until he was finally published. But during these years, every now and then on the weekend, he'd get on the train and he'd ride all night back down south in North Carolina. And he'd get off the train and he'd ride the carriage to the beginning of his old home road. And then he'd walk down to the home house. And waiting for him there was his mom. Thomas Wolfe said Big George would go in and kneel down in front of his mom. He was so big. Lay his big old head in her lap and just sob. 
and mother would say, son, I don't know what's wrong, but whatever it is, it'll be all right. Have you run lately into the arms of your God, who's your heavenly father, who loves you like and even more than a mother can? That's amazing. He does. He knows what is wrong, and he knows how to make it right. Won't you run into his arms today and discover grace and love and forgiveness and salvation? Praise be to God for the grace we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us family and moms that can lead us into your loving arms. Lord, may they remind us of an even greater love, your love, that you did for us in salvation. I just ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.